Uh, our plan for this morning is that we're going to spend some time hearing from, uh, from Leopoldo Sanchez. Uh, and then we're going to hear uh, some, uh, some reflections uh, from also David Bielan uh, after that. And then we're hoping to have a, a period for some Q&A. We go till 12.15, uh, and we'll, we'll, we hope to have some Q&A uh, at the end of that. Uh, and I'll leave it up to Leopoldo and uh, David if they want to field some questions as they go. But for sure, we should have some time uh, before we wrap up at 12.15. And then lunch, as I mentioned, if you were in the uh, CPAC um, a little while ago, lunch is here in the Student Center, and that will uh, happen right after we break here uh, at uh, 12.15. So we're happy, happy to welcome uh, Leopoldo Sanchez. Uh, he uh, is a professor of systematic theology um, and professor of Hispanic ministries also at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, he's the author of several books, including this new one, which if you haven't read it, uh, you should get it because it's really wonderful, Sculptor Spirit. Um, bottles of Sanctification from Spirit Christology. I think he'll be bringing some of that into his talk today. And he's also doing a plenary tomorrow, and then that's repeated on a Saturday, uh, where he'll be talking about some of the themes uh, in this book. Also happy to have with us, uh, again for a little bit later in this uh, this seminar, uh, David Bielan. David just retired at the end of last month after a, a, a long pastorate um, at Madison Square Christian Reformed Church here in Grand Rapids. And now, uh, he's actually started this before he retired, but he's also teaching here at Calvin Seminary. He's leading some, uh, some peer learning groups for us and working with our vocational formation office. Uh, and so we're very happy to have David here, to, and he will eventually also be sharing uh, some of his story and some of his practices. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Leopoldo and I ask you to welcome him. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you for your kind hospitality. Uh, David, you look so young. What's this thing about retirement? Anyway. Retirement is not a Amen, amen, yeah. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure to be in your midst. I was um, asked to begin with a sermon um, that brings out some uh, Global South themes, uh, particularly thinking in terms of God's hospitality towards strangers. Uh, so it, it is appropriate that uh, I thank you once again for allowing this stranger to uh, be in your midst. <laughs> um, so just to give you a little background about this uh, homily. Uh, the setting for this homily was actually where I teach at the Chapel of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. Now one thing to keep in mind is that this is, number one, a Lutheran. Uh, institution, and, and because of that, number two, uh, historically, uh, 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 culturally German, if we may put it this way. Even to this date, uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is less than 1% Hispanic, just to give you an idea, right? So it's, 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 we're talking about a majority um, white, English-speaking denomination with German roots. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of the, the uh, congregation. <laughs> uh, also, at that time, we had sort of what I would call a second audience, and this brings challenges when you have to preach, when you have two different groups uh, in, the, in the same place. So the other uh, group here were our Spanish-speaking students, some of them bilingual, uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, uh, who uh, visit campus every so often for intensives. So they too were there. So they were participating in the worship service and in the readings. And of course, you had this Hispanic, Latino uh, member of the faculty preaching that day. So that gives you an idea of what I'm dealing with, okay? And this takes place in ep Epiphany season. So kind of, you know, in the same season we're now. And I entitled this uh, homily, Galilean Epiphany. And I uh, began that day, and I begin here this day, en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The text is from John 1, 45 through 46. Nathanael said to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. In my travels around the country, I am often reminded of my origins. After a little conversation here and there, someone often asks me, So where are you from? Typically, the accent is what gives me away. I've gotten that question so many times. I now have an internal mechanism that quickly triggers a nicely packaged response. I was born in Chile, raised in Panama, and have now lived in the U.S. longer than I ever lived in Chile or Panama. As if to say, you know, I'm kind of becoming one of you little by little, but I'm still not apparently there yet. Now that response puzzles people even more, leading to other questions. The more common one being, so how do you become a Lutheran? <laughs> when we are used to seeing things a certain way, it's a little challenging to get our minds wrapped around unexpected surprises. Where traditional expectations are not met, people struggle a little or a lot to deal with or make sense of the new reality. Some, like Philip, receive the news with wonder and can't wait to tell others. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Others, like Nathaniel, receive the news with doubt or hesitation. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Hmm. Since according to more traditional messianic expectations, no great prophet was supposed to come out of Nazareth in Galilee, no one expected God to speak his word and give eternal life to his people through a Galilean savior. You see, Galileans are not your ideal Jews. They have accents. <laughs> Do you remember how people in Jerusalem discovered that Peter was one of Jesus' disciples? Bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. You are a Galilean. It was the darn accent that gave him away <laughs> as a follower of Jesus, the Galilean. Due in part to his geographical location, Galileans had a higher likelihood to come into contact with Gentiles than Jerusalem Jews did, which cast some suspicion on the purity of their Jewish religious identity and their faith in God. No self-respecting Jerusalem Jew looked to Galilee for good theology or good practice, and much less for God's salvation to be revealed. Galilee is not Jerusalem. If you want to be a pure and holy Jew, if you want to find one, the word on the street is that you go to Jerusalem, the holy city, right? The privileged center of Jewish social, political, and religious life. This is the place of the religious leaders of Israel. The center of learning, of wisdom, of power. Goodness, Jerusalem is where the temple is. Can't get any better than that, right? It is God's own dwelling place. If there is any place at all where God's salvation should be revealed, it has got to be holy Jerusalem, where the holy people hang out. Or is it? Galilee is not supposed to be a the place where God reveals his power and wisdom. 
But God's ways are not our ways. God has a habit of surprising us with the unexpected. Of turning our world upside down. And that's the saving mystery of the cross, isn't it? God reveals his power through what we see as weak. And his wisdom through what we see as foolish. Against all human expectations, God surprises us and gives us Jesus, a Galilean Jew from Nazareth, to be our Savior. This Jesus is God's new temple. And where he is, God himself is, and we have holy ground. Where Jesus is, we have salvation and lives transformed.